I, I figured since it's, uh, this represents the happiest day ever, the day that the devil lost and Jesus won forever for us, we ought to at least act like it's true. Amen. It is true. We believe it. Praise God. Before I get started here, uh, I feel like the Lord gave me the name Carly earlier. Carly. Does that mean anything to anybody here? Is there a Carly here I'm supposed to pray for? Or maybe you have somebody that means something to you? Yeah. What does it mean to you, Helen? My, um, my six girlfriend. Isaac's girlfriend. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You've got to talk louder. Isaac's girlfriend, Carly. Is there something she needs prayer for or anything specific that you know of? Not that I know. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. My daughter's name is Carly. Okay. Anything? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Got a smudge on my glasses. Yes. We know you Carly, but I don't know if there's anything. Okay. Yeah, I feel like this would, you know, somebody would, this would mean something specific. Might, might be your daughter. Anybody else? Going once, going twice? Okay, let's, let's agree. Father, we thank you. Lord, I, uh, we pray for this young lady. And I, we know that anger is a secondary emotion. There's a reason behind the anger. She may not even know why she's angry, or she may know very well why she's angry. But Lord, you know what it's really all about, and you have the answer for it. And so, as your word says, the wrath of a human being does not work the righteousness of God. We ask you to minister to her. Carly, in Jesus' name, we bless you. And we command peace. We release the peace of God that stops storms, angry storms, that would try to sink our boat, so to speak. We release the peace of God to you. Father, I, let, I ask you that, that your angels would go minister to her. I ask you that the Holy Spirit would begin to speak to her. And I ask you that you cause her to run across the people uh, in this world that will help her. Not only come out of the anger, but come into what you have for her. And Lord, these other uh, Carlies that were mentioned, or maybe someone even beyond what we know today. Lord, you may be just telling us, you lift that name up to me and I'll do the rest. Well, we lift it up to you right now. We ask you to work. And we do ask you to bring the testimony to us of your handiwork, uh, just to encourage us to continue to step out and listen to your spirit. Lord, thank you for the service this morning. Thank you for those that opened up their heart to you, because now they've got ears to hear and eyes that will see what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Jesus, you plainly taught us and told us in your word that if we harden our hearts or we shut the door in our heart, we may hear sound, we may even understand a few principles, but we're not going to hear what the Spirit is wanting to say to us. So today, I want to hear the Holy Ghost. I don't want to hear from me or anybody else. Thank God for all the things we can do to encourage one another. But Lord, I need to hear you. And your word says that I have that unction in me by your spirit to receive from you. And so, Lord, I humble myself this morning and I pray everybody else in here will do the same. God, we need you. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We give you permission to say anything to us you need to because we know your motive is nothing but love. Selfless love for us. And even in your correction, there's a blessing. And in your comfort, there's great blessing. Lord, whatever we need from you, whatever heaven needs to reveal to us today, as we share the word this morning, let it be done in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, grab your Bible. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, turn over to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. I, I don't, uh, you know, when we come upon a, a day like today, I don't, uh, well, what am I going to preach on? It's Easter and try to fit, you know. I don't do that because we may not need to hear about Easter. God may want us to hear about something totally different. I found out a long time ago the Holy Ghost is a much better preacher than I am. And he also knows the subject matter. Right. Amen. The real secret to walking with God is get out of his way so he can do something. Amen. Just giving him your life. You know, asking him questions. What do you think about that, Holy Spirit? What do you want me to do, Holy Spirit? It's when we start making our own choices that we get in trouble. Right. Now I realize we got enough sense to get up and brush our teeth and go to work in the morning. 
He doesn't expect us to have a revelation from heaven for that. Amen. Amen. Although some people act like it. But anyway, I understand that. But we need to always keep an open heart to the Lord. Amen. To where he's directing our life. When Adam and Eve decided to try to do it without him is when they got in trouble. Right. And when I live my life that way, I got in trouble. And if you're living your life that way right now, you're in trouble already and don't even know it maybe. Right. Right. Oh, wow. He's already on my case. Yeah. Because yeah. I love you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you're going to run out in the road in front of a truck and I grabbed you and even knocked you to the ground to keep you from doing that, would that be hatred? No. no. That's love. Yes, it is. Amen. Yeah. How many remember the old commercial where the guy would get slapped in the face and he'd go, thanks, I needed that? Yeah. Sometimes that's what we need. Yeah. Just a little. Come on, that's right. Amen. Yeah. Well, I can already see it's going to be one of those Sundays. John chapter 20. This is the... <laughs> Andale pronto, huh? I'll, I'll get it done. <laughs> uh, John chapter 20. This is the resurrection story. Let's go ahead and just read this down to about verse 10 or so. It says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she ran, I'm going to try to just get rid of the old King James stuff. Then she ran and, come, and came to Simon Peter and the other disciples. Whom John, or whom Jesus loved, it was Peter and John, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and came to the sepulcher, or the grave. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the grave. You know, John wrote this uh, gospel, and he's, you know, he's t he let us know he's faster than Peter. <laughs> Come on, John. You win that 50-yard dash. Amen. Verse 5. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen cloth clothes lie. Look at verse 7. And the napkin. What's the napkin? They would, they would put them in that death shroud. They would wrap them up in that death shroud and then they would put a napkin or a, like a towel type thing over the face. The napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went, <clears throat> then went in also that other disciple, which came first. He might have been faster than Peter, but he was afraid to go in, wasn't he? <laughs> Peter wasn't. To the sepulcher, and he saw and, and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own house. Something just kind of a side issue here. I was, re I was online yesterday on Facebook and I came across this on my Facebook page. This verse about verse 7 here about the napkin that was folded up and laying in a different place. Uh, you know, you read those. I mean, the, the scriptures, everything in the scriptures is significant. And uh, if you but you have to read them from a Jewish cultural mindset because that's that's the background of what it was written in. And every uh, Jewish person, according to this thing that I read on the internet yesterday, said every Jewish person knew what this meant about the napkin. That when a servant in a household, in a Jewish household, would uh, prepare dinner for the master of the household, uh, he would you know, prepare everything, put it in its place, fold the napkin, get everything all set up just right. The master would come in and sit down and eat. The servant would stand off to the side until the master of the household had finished eating. And if the, the, the master of the household got up and wiped his face, wiped his hands with the napkin, and then just kind of crinkled the napkin up and dropped it on the table, he knew that the master was finished. And so when the master walked away, he could come in and clean everything up. But if he took the napkin and folded it again and laid it down, he knew that the master wasn't done and that he was going to come back. He was going to come back. How many of you get what I'm saying here? Jesus left the sign. I'll be back. Hallelujah. Better than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Amen. I'll be back. Glory to God. I'll be back to the, the, the grave. Like Karen was saying this morning, he's coming back to all the graves and they're going to open up. Praise God. He pioneered that 
by getting his own resurrected body and raising from the dead. He's the first begotten from the dead, the Bible says. Amen? So I just thought I'd throw that little one out there that blessed me when I read it. And you know, it, what that says to me is I need to really read the scriptures carefully and pay attention. Because there's uh, little things in there that mean a lot sometimes. Amen. Praise God. So, um, right down here in, in verse 9, it says... For as, as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now, these people walked with Jesus for three and a half years. They watched him raise the dead. They watched him heal the sick. They watched him multiply food. They saw him walk in the miraculous. They, they heard his parabolic teachings about the principles of the kingdom, how to live your life so that the kingdom of God would rule and reign in your life and you could live in the blessings of God and so forth. They, they heard and saw this. But because their mindset was a religious mindset or a actually a, a, a pharisaical mixture of man's ideas and God's ideas out of the Old Testament, out of the Mosaic Law, mixed together, they didn't really understand who Jesus was. Now, Peter got a revelation that he was the Christ, the, the anointed one to come, the Messiah, uh, the Mashiach. He was uh, the anointed one that was sent from heaven, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He got that revelation and tapped into that. But how many of you have ever gotten a revelation from God and the enemy comes to steal that revelation from you? Yep. And you've gone through a period of time where all of a sudden what you really heard from God and got from God and saw from God and understood from God didn't look like it was true and there was a temptation to give up the word. Jesus taught about that. He taught the parable of the seed or the parable of the sower. He taught that there are four kinds of spirits or hearts in the world in humans. There's the hard heart, there's the stony heart, there's the thorny heart, and there's the good ground heart. And the first three hearts, because of the things that are in the heart that, that haven't been dealt with yet, when the seed of God's Word, when God speaks by the Spirit and His revelation comes to your heart, the first kind, the hard heart, it says that, that it's like a seed you know, on a hard uh, ground. It just bounces on the ground and a bird comes and steals it. The devil just swoops in and takes it because a person's heart is hardened. One of the worst things you could ever do to yourself is develop a hard heart. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Now, I realize sometimes, you know, things happen in life and we, you know, we, we feel like we have to defend ourselves and guard our heart and, you know, maybe build some walls and those kinds of things. And I understand that. But I'm telling you, don't ever build a wall against God. Right. Go to God and say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on right now. It, to me, it even looks like you're not doing your job. Yes. Right. Might as well be honest with God. He already knows what you're thinking anyway. And He loves it when people come to Him with an honest heart. That's right. He can work in truth. If you're mad at Him, you might as well tell Him. He already knows it. And when you put it out there, now it's open for discussion. See, Christians, we play these little religious games in our mind. Oh, and inside we're like, but out here we're, oh. That's phony baloney, man. God says, come, let us reason together. Let's talk about it. You'll end up walking away realizing probably you're wrong and he's right, but it's better to get that than to play some kind of phony religious game in your mind. Amen? So the hard heart is just, the devil just steals the word immediately. The stony heart is a heart that has some hard places in it. It has rocks in it. It's soil that has rocks. And the seed that falls in that area, the soil is shallow. And so if you've ever seen, you know, like a seed or a plant or whatever that's in shallow soil, the, it doesn't have time to develop a root. Now, the root is what's going to enable the plant to go complete the full cycle of bearing fruit. Right. From being a seed all the way to bearing fruit. It's the root that will cause the fruit to be born. But because it's shallow, because there's hardness, for a short period of time, there's this thing that begins to happen in this person's life. The Word of God begins to grow in their heart and in their life. But then it says, persecution and affliction comes because of the seed. Right. See, the devil, the devil knows you're just, you and I are just ignorant human beings compared to God. 
and the, the things of that realm. So he's not worried about us. He's worried about the Word being in us. He's worried about us receiving the Word and producing what the Word will produce in our lives and in the lives of others. So he wants us to keep a few rocks buried. I love Jesus, but I hate Grandma the way she treated me. Come on. Amen. Well, when God speaks, he, he dumps the same seed on you. He's dumping on the person next to you. And in a service somewhere where he's teaching or ministering to you, you, you may get, you know, a little short manifestation. Then the next thing you know, you're offended and gone. Because that's what it says about a stony heart. My God, look how many stony hearts we have in this country today. Some people, I think, some Christians think offense is the fruit of the Spirit. You don't have any right to be offended any time at anybody, anywhere, anywhere, no. at all. No. Right. Now, offenses are going to come. Yeah. Just like the spirit of fear is going to come. Right. But you have to deal with it or it will deal with you. Yes. Come on, amen. Offense leads to bitterness. Yeah. Bitterness becomes a root, the Bible says. Right. And once you have a root of bitterness in you, it pollutes you to where you become bearing fruit that pollutes, the Bible says, everybody around you. Wow. Have you ever been around somebody with a, a bitter spirit or has a, you know, a, a spirit like that? Yeah. You can't get away from them fast enough. Because yeah. they will find a, a dark cloud behind every silver lining. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell them, boy, the sky sure is blue today, and say, well, yeah, but it ain't that way all the time. <laughs> Captain Negatory, man. <laughs> I had one time a, a brother of mine, he goes, well, I know you don't like to hear anything negative. And I'm thinking, I don't like to hear anything negative? I hear negative stuff all the time. I said, it's not that I don't like to hear anything negative. I just like to look at everything from God's perspective. Right. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Have you ever read the Word or heard God say, well, didn't know that was going to happen. Man, that's bad. I don't know. I don't know. If you come up with any ideas, let me know, John. Now, Lord, you're going to mess up my sermon this morning, aren't you, already? See that. Good. That's what I ask you to do. So that's a stony heart. Just, well, how do I know if I have stones in my heart? Ask God, He'll show you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We need that. And you want Him to, because you want to yes. dig those suckers out of there and throw yes. them at Goliath. Yes, yes, yes. Then there's the thorny heart. The thorny heart, the Bible says of the thorny heart, it's made up. Let me, let me hold your place here. I'll turn over there real quick. You don't have to go anywhere. Let me look at this real quick, because I'm going to try to quote it, and I know I'll misquote it if I do try. Over here in the parable of the sower. And I thought I knew exactly where it was at. That's what I get for thinking. Ah, here it is. Nope. Yeah, that's it. Over in Mark 4, let me read it. The thorny heart. It says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. All four of these hearts hear the word. But the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, not riches, the deceitfulness of it. When you turn riches into something besides what they are, it'll deceive you. Yes. Exactly. There's probably more people going to hell over the love of money than any other reason in the world. Yeah. And you don't have to be rich to have that happen. Right. You can be poor. I know some poor people that don't have much money, and they love money more than some rich people. Right. <coughs> Deceitfulness. It'll deceive you, see. Right. Yeah. It'll deceive you into making it a god. And once, you get, you, once it becomes your god, you will bow down before it. It'll become an idol. Right. And the book of Psalms, Psalm 115 or 116, says that when you have an idol, that that idol can't see, it can't hear, it can't speak, it can't do anything. And it says people that have them are just like them. Yep. It cuts you off from having revelation. That's why people who are idol worshippers think you're nuts. Because you say you know God and you hear Him. Praise God. It says, The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, you start trying to grow the word with a bunch of other stuff that's going to choke you out. The farmers spend lots of money in this valley every year to get rid of the weeds. Yep. 
because right. it's going to lower their crop produ production. Right. Yeah. It's going to try to choke out the fruit that they're wanting to produce. The cares of this world. See, you don't have any problems. Right. I always like to say that because people go, he's really over the edge now. <laughs> Now see, that's, that's a big deception. People think they have problems. Right. All you have is circumstances. Right. Yep. And they can change overnight. It, I don't, God may have a problem, but I don't. Right. It's His thing to deal with. Right. If I cast my cares on Him and listen to Him and follow Him, He has guaranteed me, and I've lived long enough to prove it, not just have it be something I heard works, right. that He will deal with every circumstance in my life, and He'll take my life, He'll put me in the position I need to be. And Jesus said in Matthew 6 that if I seek first the kingdom, what's right in His eyes for my life, everything in my life, of my life, spirit, soul, body, socially, financially will line up in its place and follow me down the road in the will of God. Amen. Come on. Amen. It's God's job to help you. <laughs> well, I thought this was Easter and we were going to talk about an empty tomb. We are. <laughs> We're talking about what that empty tomb has produced in our life. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Next time worry comes to you, the spirit of fear, how are you going to fix that? Oh, no, this. Oh, no, that. Oh, no, this. Say, that ain't my problem. Right. The Bible says, cast your cares on the Lord. Why? Because He cares for you. And let me tell you something. He cares for more, you more than you care for you. And not only that, He has the wisdom, the power, the angelic army. You just go down the list. He's got everything He needs to make sure that the problem that He's facing about your life is dealt with. Hallelujah. I don't care if you amen or not, I'm going to preach it anyway. Glory to God. So, how did I get off on that anyway? The Holy Ghost, that's how we got off on it. So we'll go back over to John 20. Oh yeah, I know how we got off on it. Look what it says here, verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture, he must rise again from the dead. See, they walked with him for three and a half days. They saw him demonstrate his power, but they had no clue what he was there to do. Right. His main, main uh, uh, thing to do, mission, his main mission was to, the Bible says, through death, destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Yeah. He destroyed the enemy's ability to keep us separated from God for eternity. And when he dealt with the spiritual death, spiritual death is being separated from God for eternity. When he dealt with that, he cut off because out of that came all of the other things that produce failure and death. Poverty, lack, sickness and disease, you name it, go down the list. Thank you, Lord. When he cut off the spiritual ability of the enemy to do that in our life, he cut off all the rest of that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I didn't say you wouldn't get attacked with it. I didn't say it wouldn't come to your life. It will. Jesus himself said, if you're going to live in this earth uh, in, in a righteous way, you're going to be persecuted. Yeah. He got persecuted. The Apostle Paul got persecuted. The enemy came after them. Amen? But he couldn't defeat them or destroy them without them giving him a way in to do it. Right. And that's what we're talking about right here. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. You know, and I, I mean this from a right, a right perspective, what I'm about to say. I know people have been Christian 50 years, and they have to ask me basic Bible questions. Oh, come on. Now, I, I understand. If you're, if you're raised in a church where they don't teach you how to become a disciple, you'll just stay a baby Christian your whole life. Amen. And that's not a good thing. No, it isn't. That's not a good thing. Amen? If you commit yourself to the Lord and you give Him control of your life. Amen. What happened to the amen? <laughs> That means you don't, let, you don't dictate the schedule of your life. You don't dictate anything, really. Right. You lay it at His feet and say, what's, your, what's my next step? Yeah. I did that in 1979. I was born again as a child, 11, 12 years old. I didn't become a disciple until I was 29. Right. Right. 
And as a result, I was trying to live out of my understanding, which wasn't much at all, and his word and certain things I'd been taught. And I'm over here trying to live that way. And the devil's just having a high old carnival time in my life. Right. <laughs> He's taken me down a pathway. I think he had about a 10-year plan for me and Karen to, to get us divorced and to destroy our lives. Yeah. Right. And it was working. Yeah. It was working. Yeah. I was blaming her. I was being rebellious. I was being full of pride. And the Bible says pride comes and then something else happens. You fall. And I wasn't far from the cliff at 29. Hallelujah. But I finally just said, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing here. Until you get honest with you about you and honest with God about you, you ain't going nowhere. And you'll run around pointing your finger at other people and accusing the church. And you'll listen to some numbskull tell you that God's a problem. And then you know, you'll be so mixed up you won't know who, who God or the devil or you or anybody else is. And that's where our nation is uh, uh, today. Our, see, I, I, in the 50s, I watched this nation become demonized. Right. This nation is far more demonized than you know. That's right. Or maybe some of you know it, because you've seen it too. The last few generations don't know it because they've been raised up in it. And what they don't understand is that a lot of the principles that have been put forth from the 70, late 60s and 70s on have created most of the major stuff we're dealing with today. Right. Right. I never went to school worrying about somebody shooting at me. Well, I better not get off onto that. No, I'm not going to get off on that. Well, I might get off on it. Just depends on what he says. What I'm saying is, we get full of pride and we just won't admit the truth that this ain't working. Right. Exactly. That's it. Amen. Amen. As a nation, we can do that. As an individual, we can do that. Yes. When it's, if it's not working, stop and find out why. Right. How many of you have an owner's manual in your car? <laughs> and the way cars are nowadays, I can't even run the radio, man. <laughs> well, you've got to have a four-year college degree to run the radio. <laughs> I know that's not true. I know I'm one of those fossils, one of those old guys. I think I'm just going to hire one of my grandkids to stay with me 24 hours a day. So I can make it in the tech world. How many of you older folks feel that way sometimes? Amen. But we, you know, we have to stop if something's not working. And ask God why. Exactly. And let me tell you something. I can give you a word from the Lord right here. Everybody in here is going to get a word from God this yeah. morning. He's not going to tell you what, he thinks, what you think he's going to tell you. Right. Because the devil, from probably before you were born, hatched a plan to bring deception into your life. What he did with me, mix, oh yeah, here's the Bible, here's Christianity, here's Judeo-Christian ethic, and live by the principles. But let me tell you something, the principles are wonderful, but they're not the person. That's right. Amen. Amen. You need the principles and the person. Amen. Well, another way of saying it is the Word and the Spirit. Yeah. When people just say, well, I don't want none of that Holy Ghost stuff. I just want the Word. You know what they become? They become legalistic eventually. Dead, dry, pharisaical. The Pharisees, they were so far out in the legalism. Some of them, one group of them had had a doctrine that said you can't spit on the Sabbath day because you, know, you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath and if you spit on the Sabbath day your saliva and dirt would mix together and that would make clay and that's laboring on the Sabbath day. You can become a total numbskull. And some of the things that are being purported even put in our laws today are about that crazy or crazier. Yeah, yeah. I'm not supposed to go there, right? I am going there. Now, I'm not up here to, you know, I'm this party or that party. I'm for truth. I'm kind of like that angel that stood there by Jericho with, uh, with Joshua. Right. 
The angel of the Lord appeared with a drawn sword because it was the season of warfare, time to go in and take the land. And he's standing there and Joshua says, are you with our enemies or with us? And he goes, no. Right. <laughs> I'm not on either side, but I'm the angel, of, I'm the, the captain of the armies of the Lord. Whose side are you on? Come on. It's not who, if he's on my side, is it am I on his side? Amen. Amen. Am I listening to him so I can be on his side? If I'm on his side, I'm on the winning side. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah. Glory to God. You can have your own opinion about things and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to live by your convictions. But you better make sure they're right. You better ask him if they're right. Amen. So the Lord's not going to, he's not going to answer what you think he's going to answer if you're humble enough to ask him the question. Right. It, it, it took my marriage almost being destroyed. It took me, I mean, I was launching into, the devil was starting to capture my mind with thoughts where I was going to get myself in trouble. As a matter of fact, the Lord was good enough to show me my future without him. And you know where I was going to be? Dead before now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's true. I'm just telling you. He may not do that with everybody. He did it with me. Amen. He showed me, you're at a fork in the road. Today you will choose. And he showed me, you know, God did the same thing for the children of Israel in Deuteronomy right before they were going to cross over into the promised land. Moses preached. He got over there into, where is it, uh, chapter 28 or somewhere over there in Deuteronomy. He said, I set before you this day life and blessing, death and cursing. Here's a hint. Choose life. And we need to keep choosing life. Yes. How do you choose life? You choose Him. You choose to have a relationship with Him. You choose to listen to Him. You don't read your Bible trying to earn points. You read your Bible asking the author of the Bible. See, I, I mentioned about the owner's manual for the car. You thought I forgot about that, didn't you? <laughs> we'll go to, you know, well, I don't understand how come this is thing. Go get the book. Let's read what the book, oh, okay, I see. I'm, I was doing that wrong. Right. We'll do that with our car. Will we do it with life? On, this is the owner's manual to life. And the author, the Holy Spirit, through men, is the one that wrote it. And he's the only one that can interpret it. Right. How many of you have had people tell you, I read the Bible, but I don't get anything out of it? Yeah. That's because you're trying to read it like a newspaper. Right. And there's some things, stories, you know, things that happen that you can see in that. But the Holy Spirit can give you why He put that story in there. Right. And how it, how it, it um, what it means, I should say, to your life. Because yeah. God never changes. Yeah. What's that? You don't just read the Bible, you let the Bible read you. That's good. Amen. Hallelujah. A big hallelujah for Karen over there. Amen. <laughs> hey man. Praise God. See, and, and now these are, this is why the world's a mess. Right here. The devil's gone after the Word of God. He's gone after, you know, you watch this goofball stuff on TV. Let me tell you something, folks. You are not being told the whole historical truth about hardly anything right now. Right. Yes. But see, most people, especially Americans, are too lazy to get in and find out what the real truth is. So they just accept, you know, Brother Blowhard or pr Professor whoever. Well, they got a four-year degree. Well, if, if an idiot is educated by an idiot, he's still an idiot. I, I don't mean that in the wrong way. You understand what I, I got to I say these things plainly to get it out there. Just because, even me right here, right now, what I'm saying, don't you dare take what I'm saying just because I said it. You need to go home and do what it says that the, the Jews did in that one city. They searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. This is the foundation of life. Not Pastor Purcell or your favorite TV preacher that you watch instead of going to church. I'm talking to you on the internet. <laughs> this is Easter. I'm supposed to be hopping around like a bunny. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's some days ahead that we better know the word. 
I don't have time to go into all of it. I'm not trying to sit here and, oh, you're, you're trying to scare me. No, I'm warning you, though. Yeah. Just like God warned me that day sitting there in my truck about my future. He doesn't want you to get caught off guard. Right. He doesn't want you to step off into darkness. Yeah. If, you, if people really knew how dark it is spiritually, in our, even our nation today, they would be astounded. You know, the Lord told me that one reason He wants people like me, my age group I'm talking about, to not just retire and run from it and live in a cabin up in Montana somewhere. Right. Yeah. He said, one reason I need you to stay in the game is because you understood what it was like when the Judeo-Christian ethic was the law of the land. It was, it was the spirit of the law. Right. I'm not saying we need to go all the way back to the 50s and, you know, get rid of computers and, and you know, I'm not saying that. We need to embrace the new things that are invented and the, the, you know, the, all the things that come forth that we can use and all that. Yeah. But when we leave the, prince, the basic principles and foundations of the Spirit of God and the Word of God in our nation, we're leaving God. And when you leave God, you leave light. When you leave light, you leave life. Right. Yeah. And if, it, if you do that, I don't care how many computers you've got, you've got, how much technology is around you, how many, you know, you've got robots galore that they'll even comb your hair for you. That's right. Those of us that have hair. <laughs> or you that have hair, I should say. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's not going to last. There again, go back and study history. Every nation that turned their back on God chose to walk out of light into darkness. When you walk into darkness, you walk into deception. When you walk into deception, demons take over. When demons take over, they kill, they steal, they destroy. And the nation ends up not existing. Lord, you just... So good. Amen. So we, we gotta we gotta pay attention. Mary and Peter and John here are in total panic fear in a time in a spiritual season. You know you've, you know what about the spiritual season? There's the word chronos in the in the Greek means succession of moments. It's natural time. But there's another word for season that's uh, I just thought of it. Kairos. And what it means is. It's what is God's will right now? What is God doing right now? Yes. What is God showing me? What is God yes. wanting me to believe and walk in? Yes. Yes. And because they didn't understand the Kairos season, you read it, and if you read the four Gospels, Jesus continually, I've got to go to Jerusalem. They're going to betray me. They're going to kill me. They're going to hang me on a cross, but I'm going to rise from the dead. He kept saying that and saying that and saying that to these people. Right. And then it happens, and they're like, ah! What's going on? And they run for fear. Right, right. And it says right here, they still didn't get it. Right. They still didn't understand it. See, we have to be responsible enough to say, God, what season am I in? Right. What season is my nation in? What are you doing in this world right now? If you want to succeed with God, find out what He's doing and start doing, doing it with Him. Right. Well, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. And I, I give my tithe and offering. And I try to be nice to everybody. Praise God. Yeah. That's entry level stuff. Right. They teach you that in first grade. Yeah. Yeah. Be nice to everybody. Right. Be diligent. Do your work. Right. Amen? Yes. Amen? But God's saying, I want to be with you. I want you to come in and pursue me. Seek me with all your heart. And I'm going to help you come into a place to where the enemy won't have inroads in your life and take you down into defeat. Oh yeah, he'll pressure you. Matter of fact, when you make that decision to follow me, he's going to come at you. Yeah. But he, all he can do is try to get you to believe that what you've decided to do is not going to work and you need to back away from that commitment. And if you're weak spiritually, you will. Yeah. One of the things God got over to me was, what does your wife mean to you? When I was 29. I got married at the ripe old age of 19. Karen was 18. What does your wife mean to you? Do you love her enough to die for her? Oh yeah. Somebody came at my wife, I'm going to tell you what. Oh really? 
Well, then why don't you die to yourself for her? Right. Exactly. Woo! That doesn't mean that I enter into some kind of perverted relationship with her where she's running the whole show in the, in the home and all that kind of thing. Right. Right. Come on. But it does mean that instead of me getting upset because she's a human and she's having to grow as well and that I live some kind of selfish life and just, uh, you know, uh, immediately, well, you're not going to do it my way. Okay, that's it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Some people have more mercy on their dog than they do their spouse. Right. Some people love their animals more than they love their children. Right. My God, what am I saying this morning? It's true. We may never get back to the empty tomb today. I don't know. You know, this has been something that's been kind of stirring in me lately. Paul wrote in his writings that the day would come. He has a whole list of bad things that were going to happen as people got deeper into darkness. One of the things he said is people would not have normal family love. Right. Right. Wow. We've had, since the 70s, the family is destroyed. It's been okay not to commit to covenant and hang in there and fight for your marriage. It's, uh, if, if it doesn't fit you, then wrinkle that one up, throw it away, and go look for another one. Now it's all the way over into, you don't even need that. Buy a dog, he's your soulmate. I've literally seen that. People, my child. That ain't your child. You don't give birth to dogs. You give birth to humans. Well, I just love him like my child. You do. Well, then you're weird. You're off base. I'm not saying you shouldn't love that dog and take good care of him and all that. But let me tell you something. There's a difference between a spouse, a, a child, and an animal that's a pet. Come on. Next up, well, Jesus. <laughs> Easter. Resurrection Sunday morning. <laughs> Folks, this thing's going way off track, man. I saw some person yesterday on the internet. They wanted to be a, was it a snake? Or a... a They've, they've spent sixty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in surgery to turn themselves into a snake. To look like a snake. They even had their tongue split down the middle so they could have the forked tongue. Yes. They, and they have this, I refuse to die as a human. Well, I don't care what you do to yourself, honey. You are going to die as a human. And after that, the judgment. You can pretend certain things are true. That does not mean they're true. Right. That's right. Jesus said, here's how you figure out whether it's right or not. He says, look at the tree. Illustration now. Parabolic illustration. Look at the tree. If the fruit that's coming off of it is good, it's a good tree. Yes. If what's coming out of it is bad, it's a bad tree. Come on, are you here? Of course, most people today don't even know what good or bad is. You're only going to get that definition in here. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, you're being political. No, I'm not. I'm being spiritual. The problem is we haven't spoken spiritually into that arena for so long that now the devil's taking it over and people think evil's good and good's evil. When I decided to repent and... And I know I, I testify about this all the time, but that's just the way it happens. When I decided at 29 to repent and to give my life to God, not knowing how this is all going to play out, but telling Him, whatever you show me to do, I will do it. Now, that's a key right there. Because you can, say, you can get, you know, some people hang around the cross, but they never get on the cross. They hang around and they look at you, oh, look at the blood, oh, look what he did for me, oh, so, oh my gosh, oh, look what you did to me. Jesus says, uh, come on up here with me, carry your cross. Right. Oh no, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so you've got to die to yourself. You've got to put your life in his hands. You've got to let him say who you are, 
what you're to do, yeah. where you're to go, where you're to be, yes. because He has a pathway as your good shepherd to lead you into what He has for you that's going to bless you and your family. Yeah. But if you keep trying to do it on your own, right. you're going to end up in trouble. Right. And then you'll get to that place where you're in trouble. Why did God let this happen to me? You did it to yourself. Right. By letting the devil deceive you. And I'm going to tell you, when you ask him, okay, I want to get on the right path, he's going to do just exactly to you what he did to me. You need to treat your wife right. You need to lay your life down for her. You need to love her and pray for her and start treating her right. Yeah. Well, how about what's the way she treats me? I'll take care of that. Exactly. Right? How many of you found out the grass is always greener on the other side, but the problem is you end up having to mow it too? <laughs> Take care of your own backyard. You take care of you. You serve God. You treat people right. God will cause things. That's what Jesus said to line up with you. Now that's what the resurrection paid for. That's right. 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 That's what the resurrection, that, that wrong was made right because he rose from the dead victorious. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Now what in the world do I do, Lord? <laughs> Let me just real quickly, come on, get in agreement with me. Show you some things here real quickly in this chapter. They didn't get the scripture. Verse 10, they went away again to their own house. They just went home. They didn't get it. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Now look what happened here. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. This is another prophetic sign. See, we have signs happening around us all the time, but we don't pick up on them. Right. Because we don't think God does that. Or, you know, and I know you can take that to an extreme. You can take anything to an extreme. But God many times is giving us even signs in the natural realm. Well, here she looked into, now when her and Peter and John looked in there before, they didn't see nothing except the, the grave clothes and, and the napkin. Right. She hung around for a while. Right. She didn't just run off thinking she understood what was going on. Right. She stayed and she looked again. Sometimes you've got to look again. Yeah. Just because you don't get it the first time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And two angels were in there. One was at the foot, one was at the head where Jesus was at. What is that a sign of? You go back in the Old Testament, you see where God says, I want you to build an ark of wood, and I want you to overlay it with gold, and I want you to put two cherubim, two angels, on that ark, covering the top of that ark called the mercy seat. And I will come in my literal substance, in my Shekinah glory, me, God. I will come and I will meet with you yes. above the mercy seat. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Those angels were there giving her a prophetic picture of who was laying in that grave. Yes. And who rose from that grave. That human body energized by the Holy Ghost becoming a resurrected body. Yeah. Different than the human body that gets old and gets tired. Right. So what, what was being said there is, the Shekinah glory of God now has come and resurrected Jesus, and resurrection is now made available to you through Him. That life that only the high priest could approach once a year on the Day of Atonement in the Holy of Holies, remember Mary, that curtain was ripped apart when He said it's finished, signifying that now you can come into the very presence of God, and not only that, the very presence of God through the new birth was going to come and live in you, and you were going to become the temple of the Holy Ghost. See, everything here, from the signs of the tomb being empty to these angels, is screaming, life, 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 resurrection, resurrection. But what can they see? Death, hopelessness. It's not going to work out. The Romans are still in power. Matter of fact, they were after him. Now they're after us. We better hide. We better run. Amen? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Verse 13, they said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? She just lost the person on earth she loves the most, and the angels are asking her why she's crying. There you go. Don't tell me God doesn't think different than we do. He does. Wow. 
She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. She still thinks he's dead, of course. Verse 14, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not it was Jesus. See, when your eyes are set on death, life could be right in front of you and you don't see it. God always hides in plain sight. He does. He does. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He's right there. Amen. I remember one uh, Marilyn Hickey's daughter, Sarah, talking about how in her college years, you know, she was raised as a Christian, but she came to a crisis of faith. All of us have to come to a place where we're going to believe this or we're not going to believe it. And she was in college, and she was struggling with this whole thing. She was sitting in her room and sitting in a chair, and, and just she was crying, and she was upset, and she was struggling. And years later... After she was in ministry and, and followed the path of God in her life, the Lord spoke to her and he reminded her of that incident. She said, oh yeah, I remember that. He said, you know where I was at? She said, no. He says, I was sitting in the chair right across from you. He might be sitting right next to you right now. I know he's here. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. So what does that mean? What that means is we have to teach ourselves. It doesn't matter what kind of death it looks like out here, hopelessness. I've got to look at the right thing. Right. I've got to look at Jesus who there is hope in. Yeah. Paul, in talking about when people, when Christians die, over in 1 Thessalonians, talking about the day when they will all return with Christ. Their spirits are in heaven. The spirits of just mankind made perfect. Their bodies are on earth. Their spirits and bodies will be re rejoined in, at, uh, one day in the resurrection. Amen? Yeah. But Paul, in talking about that, he says, we don't sorrow when someone leaves that's a Christian and someone we love. We don't sorrow as those that have no hope. Exactly. Amen. We sorrow, we grieve, we mourn. It's all part of, of having to let go of them and, and put them in the Lord's hands. But we don't sorrow without hope. Right. My friend, I don't care what situation you get yourself into, there is always hope in God. Yeah. Yeah. If you'll put your hope in God and look to Him, you'll see Him, you'll find Him right in the middle of that situation. Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So she didn't know Him. Verse 13, or excuse me, uh, verse 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? He said the same things to her the angels did. Now, God, when God asks you a question, it's not because He doesn't know the answer. Right. Always know that. When the Lord asks you a question, it's not He's trying to get you to see right. something you don't see. Right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. She supposing him to be the gardener said unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She still got her eyes on a dead corpse. Right. Jesus said unto her, Mary. <laughs> Mary. Yeah. She turned herself and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say Master. You know, all Jesus has to do is just say your name. Thank you, Jesus. And all of a sudden it explodes into who he is. So good. That he's there. Remember the two guys on the road to Emmaus? Yes. After Jesus was crucified? Some of the Jews uh, teach that those two guys were, were his uncles. Yeah. That they were actually blood relatives of his. That were disciples. It says they were disciples in the Bible. They're walking down the road to Emmaus talking about what had happened at the cross. Jesus just, you know, beam me up Scotty. He shows up. <laughs> Amen? Yep. And he's walking with him. What are you guys talking about? Oh, you haven't heard? Where have you been, man? What planet have you been on? And they start telling him about all this. And he's, he's asking, talking to him and asking him questions like he doesn't know what's going on. Amen? And then you know the story how they came to their house and it was getting dark and he was going to go on. So you've got to invite Jesus in like we did earlier or he'll just go on. Right. There's got to be something in you that says, I'm not letting go. I'm going to find the answer to this. Yeah. Something about what this guy's talking about right now. Because it said that he opened up the prophetic scriptures. He started flowing in a revelatory teaching thing. And he started putting scriptures into those guys. And they're going, oh my God, that's what Joel meant. Oh no, that's what Nehemiah meant. Oh, that's what Ezekiel meant. 
So there was something, so, there's something here. So they invited him in to sit down with them. They opened the door. And when he sat down with them, he took the bread and he broke it. The bread of life, the manna from heaven, the word of God is what that symbolizes. He broke the bread and when he did, they went, oh, you're Jesus. They see him. You're not going to see him. God may let you see him through people at first, just like he lets a baby be taken care of by people. But he is going to require sooner or later you come and sit down with him. And if you'll do it, your life will change. I double dog dare you to do it. I guarantee you it will change you. I'll quit the ministry if it doesn't change you. Exactly. Because it will. But don't play this game. Well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to go to church and I'm going to be nice and I'm going to hug my wife and my dog. And I'm going to give money into good causes and be a good person. And I'm going to go to heaven. No, you're not. You're going to go straight to hell. Because in order to be in God's presence, you've got to be perfect. And you and I can't get there. But he is, and he did, and he said, come into me and let me get in you. Give me you, and I'll give you me. And in my righteousness, you'll be seen as though the Father's looking at me. Because you're in me. Amen. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, she saw who he was. Now look at verse 17. Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to, your, to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, unto my God and your God. What's that about? Well, there again, you've got to know the Old Testament. You've got to know their, the seven feast cycles they lived in. The high priest had to go into the pre could only go into the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah was at once a year with the blood to sprinkle seven times to cover the sins of the nation for another year. Jesus had become high priest here forever. He went into the heavenly Holy of Holies, sprinkled his own blood on the heavenly mercy seat, and dealt with sin once and for all. Amen. So he had been prepared to be that high priest. The high priest had to be prepared. Everything had to be done just right. Or else when he walked into the presence of God on earth, he would die. Because he hadn't followed God's explicit conditions. Jesus was prepared. And he wasn't saying, I'm better than you, don't touch me. He was saying, don't touch me yet. Because right. I've got one more thing to do. And he went and did it. And he came back, praise God. <laughs> Amen. And that's why the book of Hebrews talks about him being our high priest. You ought to study it. It's a good book. Yeah. Mary came and, and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, I won't read the rest of these scriptures, but here in beginning of verse 19, there was another appearance. When he came to the disciples and they were in fear, he released the peace of God to them and talked to them. So he appeared to them again. Amen. And then beginning at verse 24, there was another appearance. Because Thomas wasn't there. He missed the meeting. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And he said, I don't believe all that. I don't believe he's alive. Yeah. I won't believe it unless I can put my hands in the prints of the nails in his hands and put my hand into his side where they stuck him with that spear. Yeah. So Jesus shows up. Boop. Here you go, Thomas. Yeah. Here you go. Be not faithless, but believing. And of course, Thomas said, my God and my Father. He, you know, he, he uh, understood when he finally saw God. But I like verse 29 right here. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen, seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen me and yet believe. I'm one of them. I haven't seen him, but I've encountered him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Verse 30, many other signs... Now, this word signs in the Greek, it means miracles with an ethical end or purpose. Jesus did these things not just to look at me you know, and show off. He did these because they, they communicated something. See, Thomas needed to enter into his apostolic ministry and go where God was sending him to go. And so Jesus appeared to him. Amen. And then beginning at verse 20, or in chapter 21, was another appearance. All this stuff happened. Empty tomb. Mary saw him. Yeah. He appeared to him in 
in there where they were hiding from the, the Romans. He came and appeared again to Thomas. Amen. Right. And it says here he did many other things during that time period. <clears throat> I used to read that scripture and think it was talking about his whole ministry, but it's talking about right now between the time he rose from the dead and went back to heaven. So they decide, they get discouraged, and, and Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to what I was doing before I started this right. thing with Jesus. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? You know, it's like the, the story Jesus tells about the rich man that was in hell. And by, that, by the way, that was a story, not a parable. Because right. when Jesus told parables, he said, it is as if or like unto... He's comparing it. He's using a parabolic. But when he told the rich man in hell story, he said, there was a certain rich man. Right. Talked about him in hell. And that rich man, in being in torment, he cried out to Abraham across the gulf in Abraham's bosom. And he said, send someone from the dead to my brothers that they, come, they don't come to this place. Right. And the answer was, even if somebody raised from the dead comes, they won't believe. Some people won't believe no matter what. Right. Because they choose not to. Very dangerous thing. That's why we need to pray that God will reveal things to people. We need to take authority over demons that are blind in their minds and command them to leave. We need to intercede. We need to stand. We need to listen to God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So, they go back to fishing. Jesus appears. Verse 4. When morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But his disciples knew not that it was Jesus. See, they're still in there. <laughs> Here's God right here, but we don't see him. That's God. See, this is what the devil does with your life. He puts you in the will of God when you ask him to, and then the devil starts messing with what's around you. You start getting discouraged or mad or somebody offends you. He'll always try to get you to get offended at your pastor because your pastor's there to shepherd you and your pastor's a human and he's going to make mistakes and, and all those kind of things too like all humans do. But if the devil can separate you from him, he can separate you from the pastoral anointing, the shepherd's anointing that's on that life to minister to you and he can get you out here away from the flock so he can eat you for lunch. Right. Well, I don't believe you have to go to church. Take it up with the Lord. Right. I, I've read something on the internet. I don't have to go to a church, you know. Well, I wonder why God put shepherds in the body if you're not supposed to be in a flock. Right. <laughs> Poor God. He didn't know that, I guess. I wonder why Paul wrote, the closer we get to the end times, the more we need to gather together. Yes. Because there's, there's things that happen in this dynamic yeah. of being together. Yeah. Well, we got the internet now. I can listen to Brother Doodad and Sister Bucket Mouth. <laughs> Get my church at home. No, you can't. No more than you can uh, have a father. That's, uh, you can just pick your father out of the whole, or your mother out of the whole population of people and say, that's my mother, that's my father. You can't do that. Paul told Timothy, you may have 10,000 instructors, people you learn from, and that's good off the internet or whatever, but you don't have many fathers. There are people God will put you with and there will be a dynamic of a spiritual mother or father and they'll help raise you up spiritually into maturity. And you need them. You need to find out who they are. You need to connect with them. You need to all, you follow them as they follow Christ. You don't follow them off of cliff nope. right. but you need them in their life yes. we need each other we're all members of the body of Christ yes. no lone rangers right. lone rangers become sheep barbecues for the devil right. it's true I've watched it folks I've been doing this almost you know 35 years I've watched it happen right. I've watched it happen Praise God. I sure am glad I didn't know I was going to have to preach this this morning. <laughs> Verse 5. Jesus said unto them, Children. Everybody say children. children. Have you any meat? In other words, you catch any fish? <laughs> the word children there, it's another one of those hidden things. That word in the Greek, there's different words for children. There's a word for uh, infant, there's one for toddler, and there's one for mature son. Yeah, right. This word means half grown wow. or immature. Jesus said, you guys still aren't mature enough to start making your own decisions. Amen. 
He said unto them, cast the net, and of course you know the story, how they cast the net on the other side and fill the whole thing up with fish. Now here's this one last thing I want to get to, and, and we're going to have a communion, and then we're going to go. Jesus knew that Simon, was the reason he led them back to fishing was because he was so full of shame and discouragement and, and down on himself that he wasn't going to go do his ministry. Right. right. Even after all these appearances, after all this miraculous stuff. Right. You can get so full of shame and so full of beating yourself up and all of that kind of stuff yeah. that you still will pull away from God. Yeah. So verse 15, when they had dined, after they had ate the fish, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? more than these. And this word love here is the word agape. Agape means selfless love. The word uh, agape means uh, to uh, love unselfishly to the point that you would be willing to sacrifice for the person. What did Peter say right before the cross? Well, if they come after you, Lord, I'll, I'll defend you. I'll stand with you all the way to death. And he meant it. Because when it happened, he grabbed the sword, swung at a guy, cut his ear off. Jesus healed the ear and said, put the sword away. He didn't understand what was going on. What was the next thing Peter did? Got scared. Yep. Yeah. And he followed Jesus at a distance. And of course, the, little, the one girl there, when they were having the mock trial, she said, hey, you're one of them. Yeah. No, I'm not. Said he swore that he wasn't. Three times he swore. And then the third time he swore, he, he looked at Jesus, and Jesus looked at him. And the Bible says he left and wept bitterly. Yeah. Now, Peter... Uh, Peter denied Jesus, but he didn't sell Jesus out like Judas did. What's the word? Betrayed. Judas betrayed Jesus on purpose because he wanted a power position. He, he loved money more than anything, and he was holding the bag, and he was a thief. And so he thought, well, if I can force him into being king, I'm in the inner circle already. I'm going to be wealthy. I'm going to win the lottery. Right. And when he found out that wasn't going to work and they took Jesus prisoner, he was so full of anger, he went out and hung himself. Amen? Right. But Peter wanted to do what was right, right. but just couldn't do it. Right. Fear overcame him. He ran, he wept, he cried. He was still living in this guilt. Maybe that's why he couldn't believe that Jesus had rose from the dead. Maybe he just couldn't see it. So Jesus says, well, Peter, do you agape me? Are you, are, you the, are you really willing to lay your life down for me more than these are? And Peter says in verse 15, he saith unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And this word is not agape, but this word is phileo in the Greek. It's brotherly love. You know, Lord, I love you like a human can love you, but I can't go, you, you saw me, I couldn't go that extra step. Wow. I couldn't lay my life down for you. Wow. Right. He was being honest, right? Yeah. Look how the Lord responded. He said unto him, feed my lambs. Yeah. Notice he didn't say, yeah, Peter, I know, you blew it, didn't you? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. I'm calling you on the carpet right now, buddy. <laughs> Just for that, that's it. You're, you're no longer a part of the deal here. That's not what he said. Exactly. What did he do? He told him, keep going. <laughs> Amen? Verse 16, he said unto him the second time, son, uh, Simon, son of Jonas, do you agape me? He said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And he said unto him, feed my sheep. That's what Peter was called to. Yeah. Yes. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. That really means uh, to lead them forward like a flock. Verse 17, he said unto him the third time. Why did he say it three times? Because Peter denied him three times. He wanted Peter to know he forgave him for all three. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just like he's forgiven you for every time. Yes. Verse 17, he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you phileo me? He used the word that Peter was using. Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, even still at that, he didn't realize what was going on. <laughs> right. He said unto him the third time, Phileo thou me, lovest thou me. He said unto him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. 
Now that word feed means to take oversight. He was promoting him ah. into a position after he'd failed right. in his own eyes. Wow. Thank you. Verse 18, then he, come, he brings the revelation. Truly, truly, when you see verily, verily, or truly, truly in the Bible, what Jesus is doing is saying, I'm going to tell you something that's either going to be brand new news to you, or it's something that you, in your mind, it's not going to compute at first, but I'm telling you it's the truth. Yeah. Truly, truly, I say unto you, when you were young, you gird, girded yourself and walked where you would. In other words, you lived that self-life, you lived in that, that way, like we all do. But when you are, shall be old... You will stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird you, and carry you where you wouldst not. This spake he, signifying of what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Now, I, we know, and if you've studied Peter's life, you know that Peter died a martyr's death, and that when they were going to kill him, they were going to crucify him, he requested they hang him upside down on the cross instead of right side up, saying, I'm not worthy to die the death he died. Wow. You know, he, in a right heart, he was saying that. But also, there's something else here I think that we kind of jump over if we go all the way to his physical death. He had to die a death, a spiritual death, to where he would lift his arms up in surrender and the Holy Spirit would gird him with the calling on his life and lead him places that he wouldn't go or couldn't go on his own. He was sharing with him the secret. He was telling him, Peter, you're going to grow into this. You're going to get better at this. You're going to come to a place where my love is going to so consume you that my overshadowing hand of anointing and mantle is going to come on you. And when people get within, as it says over there in Acts, you look it up in the, the language, it says that there was a glory cloud, a glowing, luminous cloud that went out from him to where if you had anything that wasn't of the kingdom on you and you got within that luminous cloud under that overshadowing hand of God that was his calling, you got healed. You got helped went from being a denying failure to a glorious man of God. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. But what did Jesus do? Don't quit. Don't live in guilt. Right. Don't live in shame. How many people are not in church this morning because of shame? Right. They went to some legalistic church and they had so much legalism dumped on their head. Uh, I, that's what happened to me, actually. And, and I know the people that preached didn't mean to do that to me. Or maybe I was just a numbskull and didn't get it. I don't know. But that's what happened to me. That's why I didn't pursue my calling, because I couldn't see myself worthy of that. Right. But I'm here to tell you, God's not looking back in your past and saying, uh-huh, you denied me. I've denied him. <coughs> have you ever known that you should have done something for him, or witnessed to somebody, or maybe given him an offering, or maybe prayed for somebody, and you didn't do it? Right. You denied him. Yeah. The right to use you. Yeah. We've all done it. Yes. But what does Jesus say? He's saying, my resurrection life and what I'm doing with you, and if you'll walk with me, is even bigger than that. So go ahead and move forward with me. Yeah. Let me have your life. Let's go together, and you'll fulfill your destiny. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. I'm done. Father, we thank you this morning. Yes, that's true. Praise God. I just heard the Holy Spirit say something. He said, I want to resurrect destinies in here today. Amen. Now listen to me. Yeah, he wants to deal with shame. That's right. I want to resurrect destinies in here today. He wants to resurrect your destiny. You get up my age, you start looking backwards sometimes more than you should. And the devil always comes and says, well, what have you done for God? And if you try to figure it out in your head, you end up saying, not much. But when God shows you, it's a lot different. But in here today, I don't care who you are, where you've been, what's happened. I don't care what kind of thing you're struggling with right now. If you're in some kind of snare of the devil, or you've got some kind of pain in your heart, some kind of hurt in your heart, whatever it is. If you will step toward the Lord and you'll just say, I give you my life. I submit myself to you. I'm going to quit trying to be God in my own life. You didn't create me for that to work. 
and it doesn't work and it didn't work in the Garden of Eden and it's not working for me now. I give you my life. I give you my heart. And I'm going to follow you. I'm going to take your hand and let you be my shepherd and take me into what you have for me. I'm going to let you tell me things that I don't understand or things at first that may not even seem uh, real to me. I'm going to let you tell me if I need to repent. And I'm going to repent. And I'm going to choose to forgive people. Some people have dead people controlling their life today. They're alive, the other person's dead, but that dead person's controlling them because they still have unforgiveness for that person. They're long gone. They're either in heaven and hell and could care less about what's going on. And you're down here letting that, letting that dead corpse control your life. Forgiveness is a decision. No matter how many times the devil, and this is somebody in here today, right here. No matter how many times the devil's told you what happened that you don't understand, that God did it, and it was killing, stealing, and destroying. It was not God. Right. He doesn't do that. Jesus said it plainly. John chapter 10. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the devil. He says, but I am come, God on two legs, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Yes, we don't understand everything. I don't understand everything. But I do understand that God's a good God. Yes. And if I listen to the devil, he'll lead me away from my destiny and continue to do this stuff that's not going to be profitable for me or for anybody else in my family. And so I choose to follow God, even when I don't understand. And it's amazing how you get down the road and some things you do understand finally. So if you're here today and that's you, let Him resurrect your destiny today. Give Him your life. If you're here and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, you've never prayed what we call the sinner's prayer, you've never prayed and acknowledged that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior, you need someone to save you from your sins, you're, you're willing today to say, Jesus, I need your, your life. I need the eternal life that you have in you. And so I'm, I'm willing to admit I need that and humble myself before you and give you my life so that you can give me your life. If you've never done that today, you can do that today. With heads bowed and eyes closed for just a minute, is there anyone here that will say, Pastor, that's me. I've never received Christ, but today I want to receive Him. Don't worry about being embarrassed. We're not here to embarrass people or put notches on our belt. We're not going to have you come up here. This is between you and the Lord, and I'll let, let it be between you and the Lord. I know other people feel different about that in altar calls, but I feel this way about it. It's between you and the Lord. Yep. So if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, and you want to today, just lift your hand so I can see it. We're going to pray with you and help you open the door for Him to come into your life today. What better day to come to know the Lord than on Resurrection Sunday? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Those of you that already know Him, if the Lord has spoken to you today through this message in some way, He's touched your heart, maybe He's shown you some things. I'm so aware that there's somebody here that they've had a hurting heart for so long. They've covered it up with a lot of things. We do that, you know. I've done it too. They've covered it up. They've tried to, to just maintain. I don't know how else to say it. But God is saying, I want to heal that heart. I want to heal you. I want to do some Holy Ghost surgery on your spirit. And it's, not, it's going to start today, but it's not going to end today. He's going to work with you, and He's going to reach in there, and He's going to pull things out that shouldn't be there. He's going to fix things that need to be fixed, and He's going to put into you things that are going to be such a wonderful... The peace of God is going to be so wonderful and the joy of the Lord for your life. I'm not saying you won't have challenging days, but I'm telling you, when you've got peace on the inside, it really doesn't matter a whole lot what's going on on the outside. So if that's you today, just open your heart to Him and just say, Jesus, I submit to what you've said to me today. Come on in, Jesus. Whatever you show me to do, I'll do it. Whatever you say to me, I'll receive it. If you say something that I don't understand, I'll keep talking to you about it until I do understand. Yeah. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you begin to heal. You are the manifester. You are the one that manifests the life. I thank you that you begin to heal and restore. Yes, for the future. Yeah. 
so they can walk in the light. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. We're going to receive communion before we go today. Go ahead, gentlemen, come on up and serve the people, if you will. I know this is not Good Friday. I know that uh, most people celebrate communion on Good Friday, that this is Resurrection Sunday. But we can have resurrection because of what happened on Good Friday. And to us, the body and the blood signifies victory. When Jesus' body was broken, we received wholeness. Amen? Yeah. When his blood was spilled... It, the life of God. You see, the Bible says that he was the only begotten son of God. The word begotten is the word genome. The, the DNA of God was in Jesus. And that DNA, that life, that pure, unadulterated life, there's nothing in it but, but life. Uh, John chapter 1 says, In him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. So today, as we receive communion, we receive... What caused him to be able to be raised from the dead because he gave himself as a total sinless, innocent sacrifice for us and we can receive the benefit of what he did in our lives today. Amen. You know, the Bible says in Mark 11 that when you pray to ask God for something, you're to believe you receive. And of course, we know what believing means, but the word receive there, it means to grasp. Yes. You're to take hold of. If you need healing in your body, take hold of it today. If you need peace in your mind, take hold of it. If you'll take hold of it by the blood and name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will start taking you through a process of bringing it into manifestation in your life. Things don't always happen just like that. Or manifest in the natural realm just like that. But if you take hold of the covenant of God and refuse to let go of it, you will see it manifest. Mike, do you have something? Yeah, I want to um, say this. That shame deal, you know, the Lord just made it very clear to me over there that it's a demonic spirit that's talking to you. I see it. Yeah. And it's, uh, I was just talking with a gentleman about this yesterday that's living with some of it, and I was able to talk to him a little bit. We all deal with it to a point, but there's some folks in here that you've dealt with it for so long and it's so hardcore, constant torment of shame. And it just seems like it never leaves. I'm just going to pray. And if it's you, you sit there in your seat and you get in agreement with me as I pray. And I'm believing that that demonic spirit will be broke and will lose its hold and you'll actually see your life will change. Okay, so I just want to pray, Father, in Jesus' name, if this, if this, if you agree with this and, and you feel like it's you, then get in agreement with me right now. I'm standing in that pastoral office right now, that authority. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, you foul demonic spirit, shut your mouth. You leave these people's minds alone. You foul demon of shame. Go from then now in the name of Jesus Christ. I draw the bloodline over these people right now. My family in Christ. My, 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 my brothers and sisters in Christ right now. I curse you and I say shut your mouth and loose them now in Jesus' name. You go back to hell where you've come from in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you right now for the peace of God. To fl I just see it pouring out on you like honey, hot honey, just coming over you and soothing you and healing your heart right now in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Some of you can actually feel that tangible anointing of the Lord right now. In Jesus' name, I thank you for freedom. Now, here is the scripture I'm going to speak over you right now. Isaiah 58, 8. You can write it down. Isaiah 58, 8. I'm declaring this over you right now. So receive the word of the Lord. Then your light will break out like the dawn and your healing restoration new life will quickly spring forth your righteousness will go before you you hear that your righteousness will go before you leading you to peace and prosperity the glory of the lord will be your rear guard 
the glory of the Lord <coughs> will be your rear guard. There's a word of knowledge that came to me this morning, early this morning, and I heard these words, and this is going to mean something very specific to somebody, and I don't want you to respond to it now. I want you to respond to it after service and come up to me, but I, this is going to be so specific when I say it. It's not going to be a, a thing. It's just, you're just going to know. And I have a little bit more on it, but I, I'm not going to say it right now. But I heard these words, and I'm going to leave it at this and come talk to me afterwards. I heard, on the rocks. On the rocks. So if that means something to somebody, I want you to come talk to me. Okay, but it'll come to you quickly because it's very specific. Okay? Amen. Go ahead and take that with you. What? Just take that with Or let me have it. Let me want to use it to say. Okay. Praise God. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that the, the tomb's empty. But before the tomb became empty, you paid the price. And we're thankful for that. In your brokenness, we have wholeness. And so today, as we receive this little cracker, which is emblematic of your body, we receive wholeness. We choose to walk in peace and love and forgiveness with each other. In wholeness, spiritually. We choose to receive wholeness for our spirit, soul, and body and in our lives and our relationships. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may receive the cracker together. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the life of God. We have that hope. We have that hope because your life is in us. We will live forever with you. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. We praise you for it. We plead it before the throne as we pray. And we apply it in Jesus' name on this earth to our lives. We thank you for it. We receive the eternal work of your blood in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may receive together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead and pass your cups to the aisles. The ushers will get them. Priscilla and, and Dad, why don't you guys come on up. We're going to receive... Uh, Real quickly, receive our uh, harvest offering. It's an offering we receive once a month at the end of our communion service for uh, people to help people that are struggling maybe in some way. And oh, by the way, I just want to share with you that uh, um, I don't know if Karen's mentioned this before or not, but the money uh, that was raised uh, for Bernadette's uh, service, the service is going to be on what's the date again? the 12th of April at 10 a.m. in the morning in Chowchilla at, what's the name of that, of the, I don't have it right down here in front of me, Warden's Funeral Home or Palm Memorial? Okay, Palm Memorial. Sixth and Trinity. And that'll be 10 a.m. on the 12th, did you say? The 12th of April. So for those of you that would like to come. But I wanted to share with you that uh, we received, you know, offering toward that. And I think the church gave a total, if I remember, $1,600. So thank you for doing that. And continue to pray for uh, George and for uh, the family and everyone concerned. But as we receive this offering, lift your hand if you need an offering envelope. Uh, we're going to uh, receive this offering. And as we do, we're going to have two famous gospel singers. <laughs> sing for us today. Amen. An Easter song. That one? This one? White? Okay, we're going to give you this one. Let me turn it on for you. There it is.
just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to see his loving care and though my heart grows weary i never will despair i know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts the day of his appearing will come at last he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my one more verse rejoice rejoice oh christian lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujah to jesus christ the king the hope of all who seek him the help of all who find none other is so loving so good as he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. up on YouTube. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Thank you for being patient today. We just bless you and your family on today's uh, celebration. And I'm sure many of you will be going to be with your relatives. Now don't get in a big argument with them. Just love them and bless them. Amen. Praise God. Father, thank you for your people, for your the sheep of your pasture. We thank you, Lord, for what this day means to us, what you mean to us. As they go their way and they go on into this week, Father, in their work week and school and all that happens, we thank you that that resurrection power will be upon their lives and that as they walk with you, Lord, they'll see that destiny you talked about this morning happen for them. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. No service tonight. We'll see you later on this week.